Originally a cheap, plentiful, and man-made substitute for ivory, celluloid, one of the earliest of plastics, made its way into the manufacture of novelties. But it had one serious defect. It could burn. Welcome to the Kill It With Fire podcast, where each episode, a group of creative practitioners and academics from different disciplines, takes a look at cult, neglected or overlooked motion pictures in the last few decades of celluloid, when movies were films. At a high school where the students major in arson, extortion and assault, the new principal and the head of security just might be crazy enough to turn things around. That's a rather waffly tagline for the film that we're going to look at today, or talk about today, which is Christopher Kane's The Principal from 1987. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Peter? Uh, hello, my name's Peter True. And I'm Paul, the principal, Lewis. Um, you should have said <laughs> Peter. Principal. L principal. You should have said Peter, head of security. I think. Yes. Although I don't know. I'd rather, I'd rather have you the role. I think. Um, so the principal. Uh, the principal's about a uh, Mick Latimer, James Belushi, who's uh, after beating up his wife's ex-wife. Sorry, uh, divorce lawyer, divorce attorney, with a baseball bat and well, trashing his car and getting in trouble with the cops. He's sent to a uh, a, a a rough. Oh, it confuses me, you know, when you watch these American films, because their public schools are our state schools, aren't they? So a rough state school, public school, um, uh, where he uh, takes the role of principal. Um, he's expected, isn't he, to uh, 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 have a short tenure, um, as the, uh, I think we can probably sympathise with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a private joke. Um, he's expected to have a sort of short tenure um, and uh, not last long in the role, but he, he, he invests himself in it, doesn't he? Because he's, he's already proven in the opening scenes that he's a bit school of hard knocks type, isn't he? You know, um, That's one of my problems with this, and we'll come back to that, is Belushi being sort of believable in that role. And I, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll debate that. Um, but at the school, he uh, makes friends with the uh, head of security, played by Louis Gossett Jr., that's Jake Phillips. And finds that the school is uh, under the thrall of a drug dealer that's recruiting the kids to uh, push, pedal, pedal his wares. That's the character Victor Duncan, played by Michael Wright. Um, along the way, uh, he forms a, a sort of a friendship, a reluctant friendship at the start with Miss Avosco, a character played by Ray Dawn Chung, who's a appears to be a history teacher, I think, doesn't she? That's, that's, when he covers a class, he's teaching history, isn't he? Um, especially after she's assaulted in the classroom by a character called White Zack, who is white. Mm. <laughs> That's the name, the clue's in the title. Um, but he also takes on a paternal role to a, another student called uh, Emil, who's nicknamed Baby Emil by Troy Winbush. And the whole thing b- brings to a, builds to a climax, a climactic confrontation between Latimer and Victor Duncan and White Zack at the same time. Uh, uh, which we'll probably talk about that later. Um, so yeah, it's one of those uh, uh, American sort of eighties uh, mi- mixture of, of high, high school hijinks, blackboard jungle, you know, high school confidential type picture um, to say with love, you know, about inspirational teaching and so on and so forth. Up the down staircase, that's another good uh, film about American schools. Um, but it's a, a mixture of that and sort of Death Wish style, you know, vigilante gang revenge yeah. fantasy. Um, First encounters with this. When when did you first see the principal, Peter? Uh, this week. This week. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first encounter with the principal was I think I think it was on late night ITV. I think in the early nineties. Um, I don't, I don't know what year 1992, something like that. I think. Um, what stuck with me? I didn't see it for many years after that. Um, what stuck with me was that montage, uh, where. Jake and um, uh, Jake Phillips, Louis Gossett Jr. and, and James Belushi uh, cleaned up the hallways to strafe, set it off. That always sort of stuck in my my memory. You know, set it off on the left. I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but that was my overriding memory of this film for a long time, and I remembered it to be far, probably far more gritty than it is. Um, I revisited it like for the first time in maybe ten or fifteen years, probably about uh, two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, I think. Uh, when I think the American DVD was released, and I thought actually that's that's not as gritty as, as I remember it to be, and it's it's kind of goofy in a way. It's sort of it's much more Death Wish two than Death Wish, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, um, and uh, and then um, uh, I revisited it uh, sort of a few years back. 
and then we thought we thought we'd do the podcast on it. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I saw this about uh, God, it's thirty years, isn't it? Now nineteen ninety something for the first time, and uh, yeah, and it's funny how you remember. Maybe because I saw it as a youth, a callow mm. youth, I thought I always thought it was far more gritty than it is. It's got that gritty aspect mm. to it, I think, but uh, but certainly there's there's a lot of goofiness in it as well. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of that feels very much like it's tailored to James Belushi's. Yeah, well, I presence. think that's one of the main issues that we'll come to later. Yeah, yeah. Um, thinking about the cast and the crew. Do you know anything about the cast and the crew, or the, uh, specifically the crew? We talked about the cast earlier. Well, just, um, you know, mainly it's looking up the director and I, I thought, what is it about this director who likes to direct films about beating up kids, considering he did the, yeah. the next Karate Kid as yeah, well? Yeah, next Karate Kid, yeah, yeah. Um, the next year was Christopher Kane. Uh, next year he directed Young Guns. I really oh, like yes, Young Guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I'd completely forgotten the, the name, you know, until I... I looked. And I thought, that's the guy that did Young Guns, and I like. I like every time that's on the telly. I watch yeah. Young Guns. I like Young Guns. Um, but he also did other stuff like Gone Fishing with Joe Pesci and Danny Glover in the mid to late nineties. I think that was. Um, I've not seen that for a long time, but he seems quite eclectic. I think his mm. career. Um, Frank Deese, the writer of this, had, had previously written an episode of uh, Amazing Stories, Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories, and this was the first feature that he wrote. As far as I can ascertain, he only wrote one other film, Josh and Sam, or Josh and S.A.M., I think I think is how it should be pronounced, in 1993. I've seen that once, I can't remember a thing about it. Um, it's about two runaway brothers. Um, I just remember it being a bit weird. It's got Udo Kier in it, Christopher Penn, two actors that I really like. But, you know, honestly, it's, it's so, so long since I've seen that. And, again, that was probably a TV screening in the mid-'90s that... Um, I wouldn't be able to speak with a great deal of authority about it. it seems quite difficult to get hold of, apparently. So, um, But, yeah, so quite an interesting, uh, uh, in terms of the writer and the director, quite an odd an odd little pairing, I think, are two two folks that, that are, whose work's quite eclectic. But like you say, maybe you could say there's a, an auteurish team in Christopher Kane's work that he likes, you know, Kids getting beaten up, young men being beaten up by you know older authority figures. <laughs> I don't know. Who doesn't like that? <laughs> um, contemporary reviews. I know you dug some something up, Pete, because we spoke about it the other day. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, again, I mean, and 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 that same issue sort of comes up in this. Um, you've got Siskel and Albert, um, who both present opposing views, which I think is not unusual for them yeah yeah and um it's centered mainly around the the levels of violence in the film um one sort of saying that they really enjoyed it they thought it had a lot to offer and the other saying how it was a mismatch of comedy and um as they say significant levels of violence um i mean i know you've already touched upon that maybe you know for the time and you know there are those moments there's obviously the assault and then when the kid sort of gets pushed through the sky, the skylight, roof, Emil, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and 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 that seems to come up a lot in in comments, you know, even just online comments um, about the film. I think um, as well when you you look back on films of the eighties, and you think of Death Wish two, and you think of Death Wish three, and, and you think you think of those. Well, the, the predecessor to this, you've got Class of nineteen eighty four. Which is again is a high school set film with a teacher that comes in. It's a, you know there's a youth gang and 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 shoot vigilantism from the teacher. And you think about how casual. I'd not to get on my high horse about it, but how casual you know the the writers of these often threw in a sexual assault as a as a mm. plot point and 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 it does feel like the the the, the goofiness in this the James Belushi stuff feels really jarring against. I mean. Like I said earlier, the mont the strafe the montage with strafe set it off, which could come out of some sort of documentary, you know, some poetic documentary of the era. And then you've got Baby Emile being thrown through the skylight and uh, with a noose around his neck. And then you've got um you know, the sexual assault of the school teacher Radon Chong's character and, and and all of these things feel very uncomfortable to watch amidst the uh, Jim Belushi doing like you know and, and even there's a scene at the climax where he, Jim Belushi's hiding in, I think it's the shower room, isn't it? And he's mm. sort of go, they're going from stall to stall, and and 
uh, there's, there's both Victor Duncan and White Zack wanting to wanting his blood at that point, and uh, um, Belushi's sort of hiding in one of these shower stalls, and he hears Duncan's got a revolver, hasn't he? Was it one of his henchmen's got a revolver? And he hears the cocking of the revolver. You know, somebody's cheating like quick. <laughs> the, the, these these quips that that, that you know. The, the 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 kind of the might work in an eighties action movie, but in in this 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 film, it, it it just feels like a weird. So I can sort of agree with that that criticism. I think. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I so so it's kind of like a, a mixture between sort of Harry Brown uh, meets Meatballs meets Dead Poet Society with that sort of slight, yeah. you know, multiple sort of tones in it, you know, coming through. Um, and I think that, f- from the comments about it, that that seemed to be the the biggest uh, division. Um, but like you say, with uh, Belushi, you know, it's almost like a lesser version of of some of the films where Bill Murray's in, and there's an obvious in- influence of Bill Murray being in the film. That yeah, kind yeah. of flavors it, and it's almost as if there's a slight sort of version of that going on. Yeah, and the influences of other action films and things going on at the time. Because I think this was just on the cusp as well, where Belushi became a, a bigger star. Was I mean, I know he'd had feature roles before, but the year after this, there was Red Heat, and I think um, was it this, the, year, the same year as Red Heat, or the year after K Nine, and and so Belushi's persona was becoming a, a a marketable thing. I think at the point when the principal was was uh, uh, was made and, and, produ- uh, and produced and distributed. A couple of reviews that I found, there's a review by Walter Goodman in the New York Times who says that, and I think, I, again, this I would agree with this, he says that Belushi can't make Latimer believable but brings Snap to the role. I think that's fair enough. Mm. I think it's hard to buy Latimer as a sort of a, a, a an authentic, dramatic portrayal of, of this teacher or principal pushed to the brink, but it, it, it fits with Belushi's sort of snappy screen persona, that makes sense. And there's a review from uh, the Washington Post by Hal Hinson who says that Latimer is... Do you remember Walking Tall with Buford Pusser with the, um, the two-by-four vigilante oh, film from the know. 70s? Based on a real figure, wasn't it, I think? But uh, well, I think he's referring to Walking Tall and Bu- this character, Buford Pusser, uh, with, a, with a t- the two-by-four, with the image of um, uh, Latimer with a baseball bat. Because he goes through the movie with a baseball bat and a pair mm-hmm. of binoculars, doesn't he? This is, this is a yeah, weird... Yeah, I'll come to that later. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of paraphernalia for a teacher to have. But uh, Hal Hinton said, Latimer is beautiful pusser gone to high school, and he called the film a gritty comedy quote about urban realities. Which sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, that, doesn't it? A bit of a paradox, rather. Um, and he also talks in his review about, and I'm quoting, sociological chin music... Which he says is nothing more than quote an elaborate justification for Rick to whip out the Louisville Slugger and womp down on some <laughs> minority types. Plain and simple, this is a racist movie. And he goes on to say, doesn't it bother anyone that the school is a zoo until the white guy shows up? And I think he's got a valid point there. I mean, this is this is a, a <coughs> excuse me a, a sort of gang movies where they either went one way or the other, didn't they? You know, you either had these weird multi ethnic gangs like in. Uh, Death Wish 2, where, you know, there's, it's sort of equal opportunities hiring for scumbags. You know, where you make sure you've got, like, different groups. Uh, so you're not singling one out and saying, you, 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 you're, 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 you're a group of uh, scrouts. Um, or, alternatively, you go the other way and have, like, uh, gangs that are uh, sort of drawn along ethnic lines. That seems to be the case of American films, at least, you know, where you've got sort of specific ethnic groups as gangs. And the principal's kind of got that, hasn't it? Because you've got the Latino kids that 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 work in the they're doing um, like a, a mechanics class. That always boggles my mind as well. American schools have mechanics class and <laughs> learn to drive and things like that, crazy things. Um, but um, uh, they've got a mechanics class, and, and when Victor Duncan trashes um, uh, Latimer's uh, Belushi's motorbike, that these Latino kids do sort of look up to. They're, they're, they're getting a bit of respect from. They fix his bike together and write "L Principal" on the gas tank, don't they? On his on his helmet. Helmet. <clears throat> so you've got this sort of, but instead of having the equal ops gang thing that you see in Death Wish Two, this one's got obviously Victor Duncan, who's uh, uh, black, and then you've got Zach, who's white because he's called White Zach. <laughs> you know? So you've got <laughs> two two bad guys really, both from different ethnic backgrounds. And um, I, I don't think you can hide the fact that really, you know, it does feel like, 
you know, the white saviour coming in and, and saving the school. I don't know how you feel about that, Peter. I don't feel like I'm not an authority to talk about these things. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you've got the chief of security. And... Louis, yeah, the Louis Gossett Jr. character is really interesting because yeah. it's, it's sort of implied in the script that he's, he's a local, is he? I think, does he say mm, yeah, he's yeah. from that school at yeah, one point? Yeah. He, he grew up he through that. Louis knee out. And... Yeah, I feel more of a sort of affinity with him than with, with Latimer because, you know, in my teaching role, I've always sort of, Talk where I've grew up, but you know I'm not one of these like principals that just drift in and drift out and, yeah. and move around. And people expect them to go and disappear into the ether. Not mentioning anything that uh, I'm going to stop talking about. That. <laughs> well, a, a lot of the um, the other thing that came up in discussions about the film, uh, including Siskel and Albert, was um, a lot of comments on the underuse of um, um, Louis Gosset. Yeah. Um, I I quite like that balance because he's sort of on you know he's ever he's he's got that ever present feel, um, and he's got the cynicism to balance. I mean, yeah. Latimer's cynical, but Louis Gossett Jr. sort of looks at you, you think and, you're going to change things around here or something. He's yeah, got and I think he I think he comes in at the right points mm. to highlight the changes and to recognise the changes in the principal, and so I I think that balance is really, it shouldn't be a a buddy movie no, between no. the two. Um, but I think there were some comments that he's sort of underused and that there was a lot of disappointment in that with the film yeah um, but I mean going back to that that mixture of violence and comedy there was in, in the Siskel and Elbert um, review there was a lot of comments like uh, almost a conspiracy theory a bit like that um, the musical that they pretended wasn't a musical um, the barber shop thing with uh, Johnny Depp. Oh yeah, there. Sweeney Todd. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lot of um, comments on uh, there are scenes that they don't want you to see. So there was they were talking about the trailer that's or the clips that were provided to them to to put in the review, and they were saying, oh well, you know, absent, notably absent from those clips are the scenes they don't want you to see, um, and they were very heavily implying or stating that the studio was trying to hide it from people, that it was such a violent film. Yeah. Um, so there's that sense that they were almost making two films, um, some that they could put in trailers and then some that, that were grittier or you know for whatever reason. Yeah, like so, being the servant mismatch. of two masters yeah. and having two different th- aspects of marketing, so the, the, the wacky sort of Jim Belushi yeah. thing and then the gritty sort of violent death wish in a, in a high school thing yeah that that that, that kind of makes sense and, and uh i mean i honestly can't remember how this was marketed over here um you know i could just refer to you know the trailers and stuff that we've seen but uh i don't remember the original release but uh but yeah that 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 probably makes sense when you look at the picture i mean certainly it does fit into that that paradigm of films about schools and, and school teachers um and i don't mean carry on teacher you know <laughs> um but uh like I said, high school confidential, blackboard jungle to say with love up the down staircase. But there was a a spate in the eighties, was there not of, of of films of this ilk that 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 were a bit more uh, gritty, gang oriented, I suppose. There was that film Teachers with Nick Nolte in the eighty four, which um, uh, sort of head, headed in that direction. Of course, there was class on the class of nineteen eighty four in eighty four, which is more out and out vigilante action, followed it by. A board sequel by Mark Lester. Well, that was directed by Mark Lester as well, but Class of 1999 with Stacey Keach and Malcolm McDowell. So, sort of sci-fi, high school, you know, hijinks with robots. That I think Pam Greer plays a like a robot teacher that, um, you know, puts down some wayward students. Um, and Malcolm McDowell was in that. What, that's, Malcolm that's McDowell did it and Stacey Keach. <laughs> Stacey Keach has got like a, a one... Uh, uh, like a um, um, contact lens to change the colour of, of one of his eyes and the ponytail in that one. Weird, weird film. Um, Lean on Me with um, Morgan Freeman in Lean, Lean on Me, wasn't it? Another principal authoritarian principal coming in and setting a school straight. That was a really good film, Lean on Me. Uh, the Substitute with Tom Berenger, which is similar to this. The teacher comes in and sorts out the rough kids. And I think there were like new, I don't know how many sequels there are to the substitute. I'm sure I saw an advert for the substitute five on some you know a streaming service the other week, but I've only seen a couple of those. Um, a bit later on, you had Dead Poet Society, like you say, which is a slightly different milieu. Dangerous Minds in the nineties with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, Gangsters Paradise, that one. Mm. Uh, 
one eight seven with um, Samuel L. Jackson, which was, I think was written by a teacher that worked in high schools, wasn't it? I think mm-hmm. had a bit of authenticity to that one eight seven. I like that. Um, there was detention with uh, Dolph Lundgren, where he, he's sort of special ops soldier that goes in undercover in a high school. That was a bit weird. Um, and then more recently, there's Tony Kaye's detachment with Adrian Brody, which I really like, and I know it had a trouble production, but um, anchored by um, this sort of central performance by Adrian Brody. Um, that's quite a fascinating movie. But yeah, I mean, you watch these movies, and I watch it as a cultural outsider, and you think, I, I want my kids going to an American high school. <laughs> eyebrows were raised by being on the other side of the table um, and that's, that's not to mention the school the school set slashers like Night School and slasher movies Hell High, that's an interesting movie from the same year this came out, I think Hell High um, about a group of kids that they uh, decide to high school kids they decide to play a prank or like ter- terrorise this female teacher that they don't like very much but she's got a dark secret in the past, and it's sort of it's a slasher movie, but it's, but it's not your usual one of the male slasher movie. Really good film that one. Um, but yeah, there's, there was this sort of trend I think in the eighties and the nineties about vigilante teachers battling against wayward criminal students, which sort of evolved in the in the mid to late nineties in Dangerous Minds and One Eight Seven. Instead of beating these kids around the head with a baseball bat, they they used words. <laughs> they talked to them about the problems and, and you know try to resolve the the issues that way. Um, but uh, but certainly, I think like the the most immediate reference point for me is is uh, or the most immediate contemporary is Lean on Me with uh, Morgan Freeman. You know, where you've got strong willed men, male characters that are tasked with taking over in the city schools. Dangerous Minds maybe stands apart from that because it's a female character, isn't it, Michelle Pfeiffer? And then in between, you've got stuff like Freedom Writers and so on, haven't you? You know, with um, Hilary Swank, where she goes into that school and teaches kids creative writing, doesn't she? I think, mm. as I recall. Um, yeah, and I suppose that's a little bit like renounce, renounce. What, what's that? Renounce, renounce, man. With Danny DeVito. With Aeson's man. Yeah, it's in, in the military. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but let, let's talk about Rick Latimer. Why not? Uh, 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 and Latimer's this. This is a character that uh, I mentioned to you before, Peter. We did a, a, a recording about Abraxas, mm. Guardian of mm. the Universe, with Jesse Ventura a while back. And if you remember from that film, it might have you know faded in your memory. Mm. <clears throat> but there's a, a sequence where there's a principal of the high school, and it's Rick Latimer, and it's James Belushi as Principal Latimer, and it's the same character as the principal. And then when we watched The Guardians, uh, uh, Abraxas Guardians of the Universe, um, and, we, and we talked about that, I got quite excited. <laughs> that, cause that, that inspired me to watch The Principal again. I thought, yeah, then watch The Principal again. But... Um, mm. Yeah, what do you think about Rick Latimer? Well, um, as a professional educationalist. Well, th- this is the thing. I mean, he's 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 looking at his the, ethics. He's looking at the legs. Through, look, through looking at the legs. Yeah, <laughs> looking at the legs of a female student. Yeah, it's he's upscaled a female is, student. Yeah, um, which, which comes through to the end, um, interestingly. But but it's so so the he's binoculars present- motif. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's presenting that, which uh, is looking at that. So oh no, that's that's not good. Just but just to in- interrupt you there slightly, the binoculars thing. thing reminded me, and I don't know what it is. It's the authority figure and the binoculars and the sleaziness of it of Salo Pier Paolo Pasolini's Salo. You know, at the end where they're watching the torture of the youth. So the oh right, I, I I was thinking more. Um... I don't think that was an, an, an intentional reference point, but it just made me think of that. I was thinking more stripes. Was it stripes? Where he's stripes? That's yeah. probably that one that I was thinking of. I don't think. Yeah, I think so. It, it is that. It, it's that casual sort of sexiness of you know voyeurism, and it's just sort of played for last. That's but, it's disgusting now. Look at it. But he's but he's a decent guy because he does tell that student decent I, guy I, that looks up female. Yes, but, but he does say, <laughs> he, says, he says to one of his female, I don't know if it's the same female student, but she's like, uh, wear a bra, you know, you're not, I'm not going to change your It's your a bag. parental interest, isn't it? So <laughs> it's like, you know, um, so, so yes, he, he will look, but he won't let it in, in, interfere with his professional career because, you know, he's it's not a, willing to change his... It's a disapproving his look. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what... Um, I probably got it in my notes, but I can't remember. I can't remember what he says when he does that because he said he, there's a bit of an aside, isn't there? Okay, I've just I've just written next to it. Classroom. Rick looks at a female student's legs through binoculars, and I've written a box around this. Pervy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was my thoughts about it. Put pervy with morals. 
it seems. Perfect, probably with good intentions, but yeah. you know, I think I think probably, you know, in in and this is one of those things that doesn't doesn't travel well. I think we look at it today and we think Me Too, don't we? We think you know, post Me Too era, we think that's what well, that's not good. But um, it, I don't think it was very good in 1987, to be honest. But um, it's a it's a Belushi moment, isn't it? Yeah. I, think. I mean, I sort of trying to give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, you you could argue it's sort of one of the most uh, creative sort of attempts at a circular narrative character development because you know there he was using the binoculars to perv and be an inappropriate teacher at the beginning then at the end he's using his binoculars to you know defend the school and be a right do the right thing well the opening scene sets up his use of the baseball bat doesn't it attacking his wife's ex-wife's divorce Mm. attorney or trashing his car with it so you know the binoculars and the the baseball bat carry through the whole of Rick's career well I I wondered if um, you know did did they did they think of the oh we need him to be looking at, through binoculars at the end to to point out. how can we get him to let's just, work the binoculars into the plot how can we justify that he's got gone. that he's yeah. got yeah binoculars in his desk oh I know let's just get him looking up girl girls skirts, skirts at the yeah. beginning <laughs> <laughs> or, or introduce that he's a, an avid bird watcher or something at some point but uh, both of those devices they do feel like clumsy Chekhov's guns don't mm, they like yeah. let's crowbar the baseball yeah. down there. Um, I mean, the other thing about it, he's a raging alcoholic, I think, isn't he? We first see him in the bar, hammered, uh, and his, his, his ex-wife comes in with her attorney. And yeah. I don't know whether he's correcting his assumption that they've been having an affair, because he, he believes that the attorney's affair yeah. with his ex-wife was why the divorce took place. And that's why he uses a baseball bat. Um, and I love that moment when the cop arrives on the scene and he asks that Latin who's occupation and like and Rick says, school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, oh, that's a that's a that's a an atypical school teacher. That 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 the school teacher that breaks the mould. Mm. Because the school teacher and this has to be an action hero. It's the era of the action heroes, isn't it? It's well, the era it, of Steve. It did make me think as well with that the the shower scene and everything. Um not not that kind of shower scene. When they're chasing him yeah, through yeah, the stalls, yeah. 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 Um, it did make me think about the, that era of films and then how a, I don't know if he was middle-aged, but he's got that middle-aged sort of era about him. It's certainly unfit white guy can all of a sudden be an action hero because, yeah. you know, and, and can beat up these athletic young kids and, yeah. and all this sort of thing. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, the, the believability of that's a bit, um, uh, I, 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 maybe because they were on the drugs. Yeah, I mean, that it, it, it raised that idea, I suppose, that you vocalised in terms of the white man coming in. So it's that sense, in, uh, that American sense, that even an out of shape white guy can come in and just solve it. Sort these yeah, wayward, yeah. yeah. Um, there, there was also a, um, a cringing sort of moment um, of the of the white man call, "Give me five, too slow." I don't know if that's aged just because of the time and, and whether it ever was really cool but he, he's on, he's sat on his motorbike he cool. yeah. and he's like give me five high low oh too slow i don't know if that was genuinely cool at any point well it's speaking of the the, the the alcoholism there's a, a later scene isn't there when um when when baby emil yes. he's found the yeah. body and he, he's, he sort of goes to the bargain booth and, and it cuts to he's, he's, he's hammered again and he's on his motorcycle he's like, <laughs> and he, again this scene, this all seems very highly irresponsible behavior from you know a, a, a figure of uh, um I don't know if you're supposed to believe that's an ellipsis and there's a, well, yeah, a I mean, that's it's a got common, so he's sobered up. It's it's like bad coffee cup acting and it when people have got coffee cups that are obviously empty. It's a it's a recurring thing in films where someone's hammered at one point and then instantly because the plot requires it they're they're sober and and ready for action. Yeah. I mean I I think going back to what we were saying about the you know the the, the white savior trope in this and at the start of the film when he, he goes to the the new school when he's given that position as principal does that that journey from the suburbs to where he lives to the inner city and there's more and more non-white faces as well. It, it, I mean it does reinforce that that uh, comment that the Hal Hill Hinson said about it, this film being quite deeply racist. You know, and he, he ends up at the new school and it looks like a prison, doesn't it? It's got mm. these sort of high chicken wire fences and graffiti chicken all over wire. it. And, <laughs> and um, I mean, it, and it's all very territorial as well, isn't it? Like Victor Duncan says at one point to uh, Mick, he says, this is my school. 
you know, and and uh, uh, it, then it becomes a battle, like a territorial battle between Victor Duncan and, and Mick to assert their sort of authority over over. The, yeah, he says this is my this school here is my school, and I make the rules. And Mick says not anymore, and uh, you know, and it, it's uh, and, and and that we mentioned it the other day when we were talking about it, but that existential point where he says no more, and that mm, line mm. crops up, mm. you know, uh, uh, that sort of existential point where. He, we say the existential no, no further than this, and he crops up at the end when he beats Duncan in the fist fight. And he said, he, 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 as you say, it's quite you know this this flabby middle aged <laughs> white guy beating you know uh, this young. I don't know if Victor Duncan's a student or whether he just hangs around the school. I can't quite work that out, but uh, but it's certainly the best the best Duncan in the fist fight. And he says no more again, doesn't he? So that again, mm. it's that. That, that that repetition within the script that you know they seem to be aiming for resonance, but it doesn't it doesn't quite hit. I don't think. Um, so uh, and also mix moral conscience as well. You know that he develops as he's a, as he takes that role. Yeah, I mean it's quite shorthand, isn't it? I mean he's got the at first he's looking through the. The classified ads, isn't he? And and the security guy picks him up on that. And they know? all expect him to move on. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And then, but then he realizes he can't move on because that's the school. No one leaves. Even even the staff can't leave. Well, one of the that's kids the tells kid him gar- yeah, yeah. garbage, garbage. Never because he, he chases this kid into the uh, basketball gym or whatever you call it, and the kid turns around and tells him, "Garbage never leaves the dump, man. They ain't gonna leave." He's talking about the other kids, and neither will you. And mm. that's the turning point, I mm. think, for Rick, isn't so, it? So, so is it? You know, what, it, what causes his moral sort of change? Is it just the fact that he's trapped, or I suppose it, is it all, necessity all turns or, out all right in the end? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and uh, and does, he, he does get a bit lectury, I think, doesn't he, with his colleagues at that point or mm. after that? Uh, there's a point where it turns on. Uh, the, the teachers are all a bit sort of wet well, lettuces yeah. out there. Oh, we just let the kids turn up when they want to, and if they don't want to turn up, it's not a problem, you know. Sorry, Pete, you was going to say something. No, no, I just agree, and you know, he unreasonably expects the teachers to turn up and teach the kids. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and and one, uh, uh, the argument, and he says, Rick says to them, "Come on, people," he says, "You can't pick and choose your students. You can't just teach the easy ones and throw the rest in the gap. It's all a bit very right on, isn't it? Mm. Very sort of lectury." And later on, he says, uh, "This is all I got. This is it. I want to make a school out of mm. this place." Well, it is a school, Vic. It's just a failing school <laughs> at the time, but it's still a school. Um, sorry, Pete. Well, no, no, I, I just don't understand when the principal, as a job role, became like the, the sheriff of a of a western town. Because, like, when when he comes in and he sees that ruckus happening, and he just chases them on his bike and steps in, and and his authority is, "I'm the principal." Like. What? Yeah. <laughs> I like it's like making making a citizen arrest, and I'm a lollipop guy. You know what's what's going on? Well, I mean, this is the f- the flatness of the, that that final moment when he's defeated Victor Duncan, and they're standing outside, and and that line comes up again because Rick says to Jake, "We are very stupid men," and the, the, it's the flatness of the writing of this that sort of it, it should be a, a poignant moment, and Jake says, "Yeah, what are you gonna do?" It doesn't matter how. Well, Louis Gossett Jr. delivers that line. It's just a terrible line. And one kid says, who do you think you are in the crowd? And um, Arturo, that's the Latino kid that's helped fix uh, Rick's bike, says, he's the principal man. Yeah. And Rick says, I'm the principal man. And that's it. That's the end of the, that's the, end of the movie. And that, it, it's just that final exchange after everything dramatic that's happened. Yeah. We just end on this sort of flat, damp squib where he just regurgitates what somebody else has said, and Jake said, "Yeah, what are you going to do?" Like, yeah, just like. Oh, it could have been worse. He could have got on his motorbike, rode into the sunset, rode into <laughs> the sunset. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, do you have any sort of final thoughts about uh, um, uh, the principal, Peter? I don't know if. So I I think it's fair to say there's a, a mixture of tones, and some of it doesn't quite gel. And 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 obviously you 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 set up the. A potential love interest between with Lady and, and yeah. yeah, and you know so that she's, doesn't ring right as well. well she's attacked, she's, isn't yeah. she? And then and then he goes round, and there's a mixture between he's coming round to genuinely check up on her and see she's okay, but it does then just go into a flirty, let's have dinner, you know, sort of hitting on someone who's 
the victim of a recent. That's creepy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's it, that's odd. And it's like it, it, again, it's all she's well out of his league. I mean, let's, <laughs> <laughs> let, 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 let's, let's be honest about it. Hey, Don John, well, I suppose it, is, it was quite. Oh, I suppose it. Is it heavily implied or is it stated that she's going to stay? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think she, she's, she changes her mind, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah, she turns around. But I suppose at that point when she says she's got a job and she's moving um, and he just sort of, I think he just closes the door sort of thing, I suppose that's quite interesting because it can maybe take away the love interest motivation and so that strengthens his change in that what happens later is purely for the school. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just I just look back on it and I think I want I want it to be more gritty than it is, or maybe more goofy than it is. Mm. I, and uh, you know, in, in my memory, I, I want to leave the principal in my memory with that montage, which I think is a fantastic montage with Strafe set it off. That's so iconic. I think you know that that piece of music with the the rest of the music sort of falls. Well, flat, there, there was one bit of music I thought is that Elton John. I thought I had to check it. It wasn't. Yeah, but it sounded a bit. You know, yeah, yeah. I, w- I want to leave it with Jake Phillips kicking <laughs> ass in the in the corridors of that high school. I think that 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 that's what I like about this movie. And like the Belushi stuff, just feels like a massive bolt on the thing in many places. But uh, but yeah, it's a it's a very uh, uneven, and unequal, and um, inco- incoherent film. I think, and I think uh, yes, Iskall and Eber are quite. Probably about quite. Was it Roger Ebert that said this? Wasn't it not? Because because they disagreed, didn't they? Yes, but uh, yeah. the the points of violence sit jar jar with the rest. I want a violent. I want a violent film. I don't. I don't want the goofy Jim Belushi stuff. I want. I want. You know. I like a bit of violence, in films that is. <laughs> but I want. I just feel like I want this to be more gritty than it is, and that's how I remembered it being. But uh, but yeah, it's interest an interesting film to revisit and. Uh, Makes me want to watch young, uh, young Guns again, actually. I think, you know, maybe Gone Fishing. I might dig, see if we can dig Gone Fishing out. The, go, the go Frank Diesel. The, ne- the next Karate Kid. Is that the, the next one with co- the, the uh, Bonsai Tree Shop, is that? Yeah, I think so. I watched that fairly recently because my kids are into Karate Kid, so we watched all of, the, all of the films other than the dreadful Jackie Chan. I like that. Do you like that one? I really like it. Because <laughs> they, they are little kids Sorry. as well. So you are, like, shouting for, like, Fights and stuff, and you realise, hang on, I'm, I'm, I'm egging on kids beating each other up, and they're actual <laughs> kids rather than thirty something year olds. There's a whole genre, scenes. isn't there? Like in American cinema, kids beating kids up, or kids getting beaten up by adults. It's a bit weird when you think about it, really. I think that's a bit more weird than Latimer with his binoculars, perhaps mm. doing like Salo. Yeah. Ah, good time. Salo in a high school. Ah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I think I think we've uh, we've done Pete. Should we say tatty bye? Tatty bye. Tatty bye, kids. Tatty bye, kids.